Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Common Spirit Health Foundation's second program in the 2022 Human Kindness and Health Justice Series. This is a series that spotlights important conversations on health justice. It is presented in partnership with the Commonwealth Club, the nation's oldest civic organization, celebrating 119 years of intentional dialogue on the issues of our day, and the Common Spirit Health Foundation, representing one of the nation's largest nonprofit health systems across 21 states. I'm Janet Riley, co-founder of Clinic by the Bay and Common Spirit Health Foundation board member. And I am so pleased to be moderating this conversation today. I am grateful to both the foundation and the club for partnering on these important topics and for each of you for tuning in this morning. Your desire to learn more and be an active participant in our dialogue shows our collective effort to create a healthier and a more just world for all of us is working. I do have a few housekeeping items to share before we begin. Next to the live stream, you're gonna see a chat window. We hope you'll chime in, ask questions, share your thoughts and ideas. And when we get to the Q&A portion of our program, we'll try to address as many of your questions as possible. Today, our topic is the intersection of mental health and equity. We know that equity cuts across every aspect of our society and can have generational impacts on families from employment to education, health, and so many other issues. Today's discussion will dive deeper into that intersection of equity specific to mental health, issues like identification, access, and treatment. We're going to cover as much as we can in the time we have together and also provide space for audience questions. So let's begin. And I am just thrilled to be joined today by the Honorable Patrick Kennedy, former United States Representative from Rhode Island and founder of the Kennedy Forum. Also with us is Paul Raines, Senior Vice President of Behavioral Health at Common Spirit and President of St. Joseph's Behavioral Health Center. Welcome, Patrick and Paul. Great to be with you, Janet. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Well, Patrick, let me begin with you. We know that you're absolutely passionate about mental health and the healing solutions that are needed. What led you to become an advocate? Well, what happened was the fellow that I was in drug treatment with as a teenager decided to sell his story about being in treatment with a Kennedy to the National Enquirer for $10,000. And I ended up with my picture on the front of the National Enquirer and every checkout counter in my district. I was in the state legislature at the time. And of course, I felt like my political career, which had just started, was probably coming to a quick end. What ended up happening in my little neighborhood in Providence, Rhode Island, is that my constituents were more outraged by uh, the guy that had sold his story than they were about me being a drug addict. So I actually had people come to my defense um, and I got reelected. And then it was a way for me to feel more comfortable about being open, which, frankly, if I hadn't been outed, I would have been very reticent to being as outspoken as I ended up being uh, because I was forced, if you will, out of the closet. And uh, that's what you know, so when people ask me about being a leader, I say that they got me by default <laughs> because really no one else wanted to be a leader since the uh, yeah. stigma back in the you know 90s and so forth, early 2000s was still so strong that um, even though I was the youngest member of Congress, I got to be the first name on the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, principally because none of my colleagues 
uh, wanted to probably answer the 35 questions that would come if they were sponsors of this bill, like, did they have a mental illness? Had they been treated? Did anyone in their family have illness or treatment? And what medications are they on? Of course, no politician wants to answer that. So uh, sure. that the good news for me is I got to be the champion uh, as a result. So really a blessing in disguise. Probably didn't see it that way when it was you were first outed, but uh, all the good that you've done from, from that is just amazing. So we, we thank you for sure. Paul, how did you become involved in mental health and what made you so interested in uh, in this topic? You know, in, in much the same way, uh, lived experience, my own and, and, and family issues with mental health and, and uh, alcohol and, and substance abuse addiction. Um, you know, the other part of this for uh, why common spirit is, is because I believe our mission to make the healing presence of God known by improving the health to those we serve in our communities especially those who are vulnerable and advancing social justice. I can't think of a better place to be to do this work. It's great. You know, Patrick, you mentioned stigma and the stigma, you know, probably was worse 10, 20 years ago, but it still exists in regard to mental health and addiction. Where do we start? How do we begin to address the stigma that still that still is out there? Well, I would say it's really discrimination because, as you know, we've never gotten rid of racism. But when we passed not only the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act and the Fair Employment Act, we started to chip away on the practice of racism. So mm -hmm. people could feel what they you know, felt in their hearts, or, but they couldn't act on it. Now, mm -hmm. in mental health, we have an anti-discrimination statute, the, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. We also have the Americans with Disability Act, which was just celebrated yesterday as anniversary. Yeah. Um, I would prefer us focus on fighting discrimination than fighting stigma, because frankly, I still think that while the Gen X and the Gen Z are less uh, feeling the stigma than you know older generations, it's still pervasive, and the only way we're going to get a more rapid kind of promotion of mental health services is if we fight to kind of the legacy of this separate and unequal treatment of mental health and addiction, which has been perpetuated even against all the evidence that it actually saves money in terms of total cost of care. In fact, that it, that it helps promote you know, a whole lot of productivity and better life and so forth. We, we just still are you know, locked in this old kind of gatekeeper mentality that mental health is not worth spending money on because it doesn't work. When we know if we actually put our minds to it, we could show that good targeted interventions that are evidence-based really can change outcomes. And I don't think most people really know all about that because of course we've never focused on it, we've never funded it. Right, and that's what you do with the Kennedy Forum, you know, is bring awareness, uh, which is so, so very important. Paul, do you have any thoughts on this, on stigma and how we deal with it? Absolutely, and I think when, you know, Patrick let off with, he wouldn't he wouldn't be a champion if he hadn't been outed. I think it's important, and, and, I, and frankly, I don't necessarily honestly believe that that would have never happened because I've heard him speak, and he is one of the most passionate people I've ever heard talk about the, 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 our mental health system, but I think we need to speak up as leaders. I think people need to stop being afraid to admit that they have experience or, and, and I think part of that, there's a lot of influence around stigma. I don't know of any other uh, uh, medical condition that has such a, an intersection with the legal system. You know, untreated, and, and maybe why we call it behavioral health, because you know, mental illness is like a kind of autoimmune disorder of the brain. You know, it it attacks yeah. one's ability to, you know, to to engage in in in, in treatment, and and it, it manifests as behaviors that we see that we we find undesirable, and and what ends up happening is we wind up putting people on legal holds, or they wind up incarcerated. It it's it's just not you know it, it's not it's, it's not right. And being incarcerated in prison is probably the worst place to mm -hmm. treat mental health issues, right? And we see so much of it um, across the country. It's just very, very sad. You know, let's talk a little bit. This, this uh, panel is about equity and mental health. It's, it's really no secret that marginalized communities have difficulty accessing sufficient behavioral health services. How can we change that? 
Well, um, I, my friends at Morehouse School of Medicine, Dr. David Satcher, former CDC and Surgeon General, first report on mental health from a Surgeon General's office came from Dr. David Satcher. You know, he talks a lot about uh, political determinants of health. So these aren't just accidents that minority communities end up in impoverished um, areas where there isn't access to health care, human resources, services, housing. These are the end result of deliberate, you know, or uh, unwitting policy decisions that are made in, in both the capitals in Washington and the state capitals that really underfund uh, minority neighborhoods because of systemic racism, frankly. And, uh, and then leave, to Paul's point, people um, ending up in a criminal justice system when they really needed a public health system to address mental health and addiction, which, of course, we don't see. To your point, Janet, it's an access issue. And we saw it pronounced in COVID where the disparities in outcomes for black and brown communities particularly was so pronounced. And frankly, it's worse in behavioral health. So if we saw higher mortality rates in COVID and so forth, we have actually, according to this recent uh, CDC report, seen much higher overdose rates among black communities now uh, tracked in the recent data and that's directly a result of lack of access to your point of in-network um, treatment for mental health, which uh, I frankly think is as outrageous as the uh, the pharmaceutical industry kind of, you know, there's a new book out um, from the Washington Post about calling it a, um, a cartel, you know, to influence it through a very publicly corrupt influencing of financial incentives to push Oxycontin out there and the Kinsey's of the world all doubling down and creating this opioid crisis. Um, we also had a commensurate um, accountability we've never really insisted upon from the payer world because we lit the fuse with the opioids, but we never put out the fire when we could identify people as having addiction. And the payer community really was awfully slow and that's making it that's a generous comment in responding to this um so i think that accountability has got to be our key going forward we have to all hold each other more accountable to to doing what is kind of unnatural to us like paul said to where we don't look at these as character flaws we look at them as the chemistry issues because no one wants to be a drug addict. When they are in the throes of addiction, they're not making a choice every day to, to get arrested, to lose their jobs, to alienate their family. That is part of the brain illness. And unless we understand that, we become victim to the bias that is you know, really a result of the misunderstanding about these brain illnesses. Yeah. No, so true. Um, Paul, in your role, how, what do you see? What are some of the barriers to access for some of these communities? And, and what can we do to address them? I, I can give you some real life examples of, of as, a, as a provider um, of, of services, uh, full continuum of inpatient and outpatient care. Uh, some of the things I've seen and learned over the years uh, recently, we had a we had a grant where we were doing some maternal mental health uh, to treat uh, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And one of the things that we wanted to do with that grant is is remove all the barriers. So what we developed was a was a a, a plan to to market that women could access these services regardless of what their insurance status was. Uh, we, we weren't going to ask those questions, much like you do at Clinic by the Bay, by the way. Um, and, and, and what we found out from that after, after many, many months of, of doing this is that half the, half the women that enrolled in these services had commercial insurance. That yeah. blew me away. It was like, okay, there's something wrong with this picture. Right. Uh, you just about need a degree to be able to navigate the mental health system because it's so difficult to access services. Even with federal mental health parity, we still have we still have problems with with quantitative treatment limits where we're told, you know, the hoops you, that one has to jump through, not to mention you add the stigma to that. And, and, and then there's also the factor in, in when we're talking about uh, health equity, 
another thing that we found out with the, uh, through that through that process was that they these women told us they wanted to be treated by people from their own background they wanted to be treated by people that had the same and kind a of cultural and ethnic experiences as, as they had they they felt like they were better understood by providers and you know we also common spirit also has a relationship with Morehouse College and uh, Charles Drew University to to try and and bring that 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 element uh, more to the forefront in 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 our our healthcare system. And to that point, uh, Janet, um, you think about the racial pandemic, um, obviously awakening for many white Americans, not a, a real newsflash for anybody of color. But you think about the fact that 229 um, people of color have been killed since George Floyd at the hands of police. And and it's not surprising when I talk to my friends um, uh, that they tell me like they 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 cleared the hoodies out of their kids closet because they couldn't stand the fear of their child being killed. And this is uh, uh, the country we live in. And um, unless we do better kind of anti-bias uh, education, and we look at the systemic uh, racism within our justice system and so forth, we're, we're not going to change this. To, to Paul's point, cultural uh, humility and, and competency is real. Like if you're a Black person and you've got this, uh, you know, really existential worry you know, talking to a white person may not do it. You may really want someone who can sort of understand implicitly, because even if they have a diagnosis, like we know in mental health, it's the uh, environmental stresses that often trigger these, um, you know, pre uh, uh, existing diagnoses. So stress and the environment need to be part of the discussion, but you can't really have that discussion if the therapist isn't in a place where the therapeutic relationship can work. Because as Paul knows, the therapeutic relationship is really key to the uh, successful outcomes of patients. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that good match, um, then, then your chances of having successful um, treatment are diminished. So that's to Paul's point, we have never really looked at the pipeline of workers and workforce that um, represent the black and brown community. Um, and, and we can't just assume that just a, having a mental health provider is gonna suffice. We have to have uh, cultural competence as well. I, I completely agree. We see that at, at Clinic by the Bay, the clinic that, uh, that I co-founded here in San Francisco. Uh, about 60, 65% of our patients are monolingual Spanish speaking, and it just makes a world of difference if we can have a provider, you know, uh, uh, who is culturally competent and then speaks the language. So, so very important. But what we're also seeing, you know, post-pandemic, just a lack of providers all around. Right. What are we going to do about that? Um, you know, is there a pipeline that is that is building? Um, so we will have more providers of all types. Yeah. You know, Janet, we should be priming the pump of this pipeline of workers. It's the existential challenge for our time. It is the 800 pound gorilla. Another it is the elephant in the room. We all know we cannot meet the tsunami of need out there unless we get more care providers. It's great to have the apps. It's great yeah. to have telemental health, which helps us leverage the finite resources we already have. But we need a care workforce. And frankly, Senator Wyden, chairman of the finance, uh, minority uh, member Mike Crapo from Idaho, they're good friends. They care about this. But the American health insurance plans have really been woefully neglectful in taking a leadership position to work with these senators and the, and the leadership in Washington to help find the revenue sources to, to meet this future need. And in, in addition to the existing need, we, we really need kind of a FEMA to just address existing need, which means we ought to have expedited certification, much like we would if it were any other kind of a, a war situation. You know, we run people through training in order to meet the needs of our frontline, uh, you know, first responders. We need that now. And uh, it's shocking to me that we're not better organized and prepared to deal with this. And more so that these insurers are taking huge profits off the table because they didn't have any of these 
you know, elective surgeries and inpatient reimbursements for the last couple of years because of COVID. Sure. And yet they've never drilled those resources back into meeting the this the in-network demand because of course they most people are now going out of network because most of the therapists aren't paid enough at least to to their market power. Um, they prefer to take cash out of network, so the payers are blaming the providers when in fact the the payers, i.e., the insurers, have never paid the providers. Um, effectively, sufficiently, what they would otherwise pay other medical providers. Um, so these are the, quote, non-quantitative treatment limits that Paul was talking about. In other words, we just have to have, be more accountable as, as citizens of this country to use our political power to say to payers they got to do a much better job than they're doing today. And I might add one last thing is, you know, San Francisco's in the uh, – Ninth Circuit Court, federal court, and you have that WIT decision in Northern California against United Healthcare, and that's an Exhibit A of where uh, the largest payer in this country um, chose to use their own financial medical management practices in term determining whether you got care and how long that care was and what kind of care that was. In, in, um, in their medical management decisions, as opposed to using generally accepted medical standards of care, like we would expect them to use in cancer and cardiovascular disease. And, uh, it, it, you know, we, we just need your viewers to understand that there's a lot more we need to be actually doing. We're hearing a lot of talk out there, but we need action to change the status quo. Yeah. Well, definitely a call to action. So, so appreciate that, Patrick. You know, the cost, let's talk about the cost of care. Providing access and quality treatment is extremely expensive. So how do we bring down the cost to entry for access so services can be utilized by people in need? And Paul, maybe you want to speak to that first. Yes, you know, I, I have long held the belief that we have the resources and the ability to to put together a system of care with the upstream and downstream uh, supports that, that that make it necessary to maintain mental wellness, um, to the early detection and prevention. But we have a bifurcated and trifurcated system in this country where, depending on your payer, you know, government payers, even even the difference between Medicaid and Medicare is 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 stark. They don't they don't play by the same rules. Uh, uh, things like copays are different. Take somebody on a fixed income that's got Medicare um, and and try to get them into the level of care and treatment that that is that is determined by the by the assessment and and what's what's determined as medical necessity. They can't afford to to take part in an intensive outpatient program or a partial hospitalization program because the copays are just exorbitant. I would waive those copays in a heartbeat if I could, but it's considered an enticement and we can't do that. Okay. But the thing is, is, is that is that when we look at when we look at successful uh, programs that 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 have uh, tried to solve for this, we see things. I'm I'm actually part of a, a behavioral health action coalition in, in California that developed a blueprint for for behavioral health, and and it was done so at the request of Governor Newsom, um, and and we you know we just met yesterday to, to to talk about this. What where do we take this? Our our aim was to educate, elevate, and innovate to educate our, our legislative body in California about the, the things around behavioral health, but also to provide a solution, an answer to this. And that solution is let's let's find ways to, to break funding. Let's find ways to, to, to create those bridges between the public and private, which is something I've been wanting to do for years and years. But we see these things uh, develop like Be Well Orange and, and these other models that, that have gone in the community. It's about asking the right questions, getting the right people to table, and, and getting the commitment from, from all of these uh, folks to, to be able to, uh, to provide the solutions. And then I think we, I, I don't think, I know, we can create a, a, a functional mental health system that can really remove the barriers to access that, you know, anybody can get the, the, the level of care that they need. And I absolutely agree with Patrick. He and I've had this conversation many times is that trying to fight for reimbursement, it, it's, it's the provider's decision as, as to how to treat the patient. And we're being dictated uh, as to, as to what, you know, what kind of treatment we should be providing. I think there is an opportunity to collaborate with the payers. I, I don't, you know, I don't think anybody's being, you know, uh, purposely, you know, wanting to, to, to but it, it's, 
it's a business in some senses, but at the same time, there are solutions to this. There are ways we can, you know, we can we can create models of care that are, that are functional and cost effective. Patrick, have you seen that in, in negotiations be, with the payers and be successful or successful models to help to alleviate the the uh, access because of because of costs? So understand, we have stage four treatment. Like we would never wait for cancer treatment to begin stage four, but that's where we begin with mental health. So no wonder, Janet, it's so costly yeah. because we wait for these illnesses to pathologize. 50% of these illnesses onset, you know, is in the teenage years. And uh, we ought to know that if we're not addressing early intervention to Paul's point, sure, there's gonna be a whole lot of downstream costs. If we could ever align financial incentives Jennifer, for a long-term ROI, I think all the payers would be investing a lot earlier on if they own that patient, kind of like Kaiser does over a longer period of time. They would see the value of 80% of the costs in this country are driven by chronic diseases. And wow. we know depression, anxiety, addiction is just pouring gasoline on the fire and exacerbating those costs. It makes so much financial sense to get in and address the underlying behavioral health issues um, as the exacerbating factor and thereby reduce the cost, which is all manifest in the fact that we have a sick care system, a crisis response, and we don't reimburse these illnesses in a chronic care way. Yeah. You know, the other, another point is sometimes people who do have mental illness are not necessarily willing to get help or assistance. How do we uh, help folks uh, realize that it's okay to seek treatment? And in fact, there are places where they can go and get this treatment. It may have to go through a few hurdles, but, but most communities do have help and they can get it. Um, how do we kind of break through this resistance that we see in some folks? Well, I, for one, think we need to involve the whole family or, or and by that family, you know, friends in the community, because if you've got a partner in the journey, you're not trying to fight for the care that you're also receiving. You make getting access a lot, you know, more effective. Um, and also for those of us who have had diagnoses, we should be doing advanced directives so that if we fall back into psychosis, if you have um, uh, schizophrenia, for example, or bipolar, or you fall back into addiction if you have a substance use disorder, you have pre-indicated to an appropriate loved one who can help intervene and make decisions for you. As you know, with the homeless population in your city and across America, this is a really big existential issue for our country. How do we get guardianship? How do we get conservatorship? In other words, how do we make sure we treat people when the insight that they have does not help them recognize how ill they really are? So there's a lot of things that we need to fix and, and, and to Paul's point, if we want to move people out of the criminal justice system, really, we need a stronger civil justice system. Uh, my own case, my brother and sister, and I saved my mother's life by getting guardianship of her. She's today able to visit with my children, her grandchildren, because we were able to access the legal system to get her the help she needed. Most families don't know how to navigate the justice system either so that their, their loved ones don't become victims of a criminal justice system, but rather can get the care they need when they need it. So, Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think that uh, education and stigma plays a, plays a part in this. But at the same time, you know, we have created a monster of a system in that uh, oftentimes if a patient comes to the emergency room, they have to be put on a legal hold or they're not considered uh, medical necessity is not considered to be, you know, uh, proven, which and, 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 and I really I, I take great issue with this because people that need help oftentimes don't know, don't know they need help. I, I had mentioned earlier that, that mental illness and substance abuse is all, often like an autoimmune disorder of the brain. 
And, and yes, there are people that, that will refuse help. But, you know, my first six years in, in healthcare was working at a substance abuse treatment center. I saw many people come into that treatment center as defiant as defiant could be and, and leave a changed person, you know, with, with a whole different attitude and, and with a desire to, you know, to, uh, uh, to, to live a, a life of recovery. Um, but we have a system where, you know, if you're going to come to the emergency department, you're going to be put on a legal hold. You're going to be uh, possibly injected with with medications that have uh, bad side effects. Uh, if that's your experience, we have just traumatized, you know, mm-hmm. you and and many, many others in, in a way that, that we didn't ever give them the opportunity to uh, uh, trauma informed care, I think, is one of one of the answers. I think education and then you 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 factor in when we're talking about the you know the, the the mental health equity. You factor in there has to be education on the cultural differences. Uh, there are some cultures that just don't you know they don't see mental health and mental health issues the same way. Um, we need and to more be, reluctant to to we, you know to yeah, to seek treatment. Yeah. We need to meet people where they're at. And right. We need to understand, and we need to, to build those bridges so that they can uh, access, the, you know, the care. That they, and I, I want to point out, I really appreciate Patrick's comment about the chronicity of these of, of these disorders. Oftentimes, it, it's like any other medical condition: diabetes, hypertension. It doesn't just go away after five or six different, you know, tr- treatments or sessions. There are people that need to stay in treatment for. We, we've got patients that have been engaged with a the therapist for for a couple of years. I sincerely believe that, that their quality of life is is contingent upon that that relationship, but we we have a we have a healthcare system that does not support that 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 concept. Is is it? And like you said, Patrick, it is. It, these things are chronic. So so Janet, just to play off of that for a second. First of all, yeah. thanks to Daryl Steinberg, when he's Senate president, for getting Prop sixty three through. We have to do right. some improvements to Prop sixty three uh, to fund things in a systemic way. And we ought to do um, first instance of schizophrenia specialty coordinated care. So to Paul's point, you wouldn't have to give people such high doses of antipsychotics if you met their first psychosis with the appropriate rapid urgent care. Because if you wrap them around the, the care, then you're not letting their illness pathologize, which means you're not waiting for them to go through five or six more psychotic breaks, where at the end of it, they're going to have to take more meds, which creates those side effects that Paul mentioned, which of course makes them not want to take the meds. So a real key is back to early intervention. And uh, you have the opportunity in California to do that because of the, not just you have Medi-Cal, but you have this Prop 63. If, if it's all organized uh, more effectively, you could implement these big changes. Yeah. And let's hope that we that we can do that. And you know, there's so much suffering that takes place between you know the moment that a mental illness presents itself to where it becomes you know a crisis. It's just in in some ways, it's just so unnecessary and always just tragic, and always tragic. But Paul, what can healthcare? Uh, how can healthcare play a larger role uh, in the conversation relating to access, identification, and this sustained treatment for marginalized communities? to help achieve parity in care. Honestly, you know, I, I believe there is there is great value in collaboration with with community based organizations. Really bringing can I, I, this is this is the way I describe our behavioral health strategy at Common Spirit. It's it's uh, connecting the dots and filling the gaps. We have to connect the dots between all the different services that are out there. We have to create collaborative relationship with between public and private part, uh, 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 payers and, and providers. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we've got to bring the right people to the table and, and, and come up with solutions that are uh, because this is a community issue. It's, and it's not one health care system, one hospital or, yeah. or one public health, you know, behavioral health department's issue. It's the entire community's issue. To Patrick's point, when you see somebody on the news and I've seen this and I've actually cried when I've seen this and I've seen somebody get shot by police because they didn't know how to handle a situation. I've had sheriffs bring patients into our hospital and, and, and met the patient up front and asked the sheriff to remove the handcuffs and, and, and been asked, are you sure? And, and, and it was after a, you know, a conversation with the patient that, yes, I was sure, because I had established some therapeutic rapport with the patient. I, you know, and, and I kind of knew that the patient's behavior was a reaction to the, you know, to the, to the law enforcement intervention. Um, 
it, it, it's it's just I, I mean, there's so much misunderstanding in education that needs to to take place. But so much collaboration, I think, is is the key to uh, uh, to helping to normalize this. To, to making sure that we, you know, that we are addressing the access. I think there's educational opportunities. I don't, I don't think, you know, July is National Minority Mental Health Month. How many people know that? I mean, how, how many, how many people? It's on, it's on the HHS website, but how many people actually are aware of that, even in the healthcare system? So it, it's the, you know, the stigma of mental health goes well beyond the illness and the patient and the behavior. It, it is pervasive throughout our healthcare system, throughout the payment systems. Uh, e even in the in the attitudes and, and the understanding or misunderstanding of, of, of people in the community, uh, they they don't you know they they think of mental illness as oftentimes serious mental illness. So you know it's it's not until they see somebody that is getting shot on you know by by police that yeah. it, you know and it it, it just it, it paints a picture I think and and, and creates a, a a mindset that uh, that that mental mental illness is is something we fear what we don't understand. And, and, and I honestly believe that, that, that when, we, when we don't understand this, we fear it. And when we fear it, we, you know, we stigmatize it. You, you add to that the, 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 the socioeconomic disadvantages of, of minority communities. They don't stand so, a chance. <laughs> Paul, are those collaborative conversations happening with community organizations at Common Spirit Health? Can you tell us a little yes. bit about that? We have been, uh, our, our community health of uh, 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 area has been working on on, on uh, a collaborative community network, CCN network, trying to be the collaborator and the convener to bring these 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 folks to the table to be able to have these discussions, to connect those dots and make sure that those wraparound services, when I what I call upstream and downstream supports, mm -hmm. the upstream uh, supports are the are the are the early inter prevention and intervention, the, the education pieces, the uh, you know. Uh, Let's figure out what's missing in our community, and, and and let's figure out how to how to how to put that there. It's often met. I was listening to the radio this morning about uh, a, a shelter in Sacramento that was was creating a lot of uh, public unrest. Um, they call it NIMBY, not in my backyard. You know, um, it, it's it's a mindset of communities that they you know they fear what they don't understand. They don't realize that by providing these services, they will they will help prevent these 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 situations from, from even happening. Yes. Um, there's just so much work that needs to happen on the front end and the back end so that once somebody does engage with the mental health system, that they have the supports that they need in the community to maintain a level of wellness. Patrick, are you seeing increased collaboration in communities? Yes. Yeah, providers so and community health groups? Yeah, I mean, that is the answer. We have to align financial incentives. And of course, this doesn't just reside in the healthcare system. To Paul's point, you know, it's a government public private partnership. We have to align kind of braided funding, if you will. So if, if the savings and attribution of doing this intervention reduces the criminal justice budget, well, then we want a piece of the criminal justice budget. If it reduces the demand for housing, well, then we got to have housing part of it. It's certainly going to reduce the demand for, you know, the emergency response where, you know, all you have are fire engines and ambulances going out to pick people off the street. I mean, huge expense, people cycling in and out of jails and ERs, huge expense. So if you provided these services up front, if you had a prospective payment model, you could have attribution on where all the savings to the whole system are. The problem is we don't have the, the um, value and the ROI clearly delineated just on the medical side, even though we know integration reduces total cost of care. But we there's the big ROI is if you understand the, the systemic impact of helping wrap your arms around someone and giving them all the little pieces of the services to Paul's point in a community. Now, we're moving towards value-based contracting. We've had it in physical health. We really haven't had it in mental health and addiction. We need to do that. Thankfully, it's starting. But I think today um, it would be really useful if we started really understanding and narrowing down on what do value-based contracts look like? How do we have these public dollars match the healthcare dollars in collaboration with the payers, that's where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck. 
Um, and in Rhode Island, when I was representing, we had all the payers pay a capitated rate of their market share to a prevention fund. None of them could justify it individually, but collectively they knew if they had done X, Y, and Z, to Paul's earlier point about maternal and child health and the nurse family partnership, which is like one of the gold standards of evidence-based interventions, it reduced the total cost down the line, which meant all of their subscribers, whether they ended up in Blue Cross or in this case in California, Kaiser or you know, Aetna United, they were going to be lower cost patients because they collectively all invested in prevention. Um, we need to come up with these kinds of solutions financially, you know, work with like reinvest reinsurance companies, you know, who's highest risk. Let's do an extra double down on those families where you come from a family of trauma. Um, you've been you filled out those A scores, as we know, from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And if we do the focused interventions there, we could have a huge systemic impact. We know what to do. That's the thing, Janet. We know what to do. We just have to get the political will and align the uh, stakeholders to get it done. Yeah. You know, we've talked about a number of challenges, and, and there are, particularly mental health and, and equity. Um, what makes you optimistic for, for the future? What makes both of you optimistic? You know, honestly, I think the COVID pandemic has really shown a spotlight on on, on what happens when we do, when we aren't able to provide services. Um, I, I'm optimistic. You know, in some respects, there's been a lot of government funding that's been thrown at a problem. As Patrick mentioned, the opioid crisis, and, yeah. and we're seeing we're seeing the opioid deaths and overdoses increase. Okay, well, it's it's not that it's not that they were wrong in 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 uh, uh, appropriating funding for that. It's how are we using it? And I can tell you exactly is that we spend a lot of money on, on putting substance use navigators in our, in our emergency departments, but we spend no money on ensuring that there is residential treatment available. Try to go out and find residential treatment for substance abuse disorders. If you don't have money in your pocket, they, they will tell you, oh, yeah, we'll try and bill your insurance company, but, but you're on the hook. You need to sign the paper saying you're going to be financially responsible. Who can afford thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for that? You know? Yeah. The socioeconomically disadvantaged folks absolutely cannot. And, and you know, and, until we make those uh, those levels of treatment accessible and affordable for people, and I absolutely agree that the, the, the value-based agreements, however, the reimbursement has to be fair, okay? I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in a situation now where you know, I got a letter from one of our counties uh, recently. It says, you know, you're going to accept what we're going to pay you. And it doesn't even, it doesn't know anywhere near cover our cost. But but we're forced to, to, to accept that, okay? With 35% of our population being covered by, by, by Medi-Cal in the state of California, they are by far one of the largest providers and payers of service. But if providers can't afford to, to, to pay that, uh, and, and coincidentally, about 35% of, of uh, psychiatrists and other you know, high-level licensed providers will not accept these patients because they cannot take the, that level of reimbursement. It's it's just it's it's a financial uh, recipe for disaster. Well, that doesn't sound like a lot of optimism, Paul. But <laughs> well, but, but let, let me let me finish. I, I think I think I think all of this kind of is is coming to a, a a head in that we're coming to realize that that these these solutions that Patrick and I've been talking about yeah. are, are absolutely essential. That we have got to to come together and and find the solutions to these things because. Uh, it's just going to get worse if we don't. And like you said, the solutions are out there, right, Patrick? The solutions are out there. We know what we have to do. I just want to remind our viewers to submit your questions. I see them coming streaming in, but we're going to get to questions in a few minutes. So if you have any, now's the time to submit them. Patrick, what makes you optimistic? You live and breathe this every day. What do you see? What are the successes? Well, uh, my wife is a 14-year veteran as a public school teacher uh, in my wow. area. And uh, she was just uh, uh, really pushing our governor in New Jersey, who's a personal friend of ours, to make children's mental health, particularly how do we build out Medicaid reimbursement for telemental health in every school where kids don't need an IEP to get reimbursed uh, mental health so that we can get into that prevention piece, which and if you add uh, things like 
problem solving skills and coping mechanism development. In other words, we can teach kids about their amygdalas, overriding their prefrontal cortexes, teach them that mindfulness, teach them how to cope with stress, which as we all can acknowledge is what really exacerbates you know, mental health. That's a real positive for the future. The other thing is, you know, last week, Senator Schumer introduced a commercialization bill for marijuana, and it got a lot of pushback, which I was very excited about because we know that we already have an addiction crisis, a mental health crisis, a homeless crisis. The last thing we need to be doing is pouring gasoline on the fire. And people who live in states like California know the cost of this whole experiment on commercialized uh, marijuana. And I know in my area, we we banned gummy bears with THC. We banned the vaping. We And there's even elixirs with THC infused and edibles. And but unfortunately, minority neighborhoods are, are the places where all these pot shops are ending up, just like with liquor stores, 13 times more likely to be in a black or brown community than a white community. And so we have to understand this whole canard that this is social justice to give people more marijuana is just such a joke. What we need to do if we care about the over-incarceration minorities is address systemic bias within the criminal justice system. Don't have this kind of, um, you know, meet them where they are, but leave them there because they're minority and they don't, they're don't they not worthy of the treatment that Paul and Common Spirit can give because there's no reimbursement for it. That's what happens when we, you know, have a lack of a public health approach. But I was happy to see the pushback on this uh, commercialization. I mean, we if we didn't learn from Purdue Pharma, you know, ginning up the, the production in order to, you know, bring addiction for profit to the fore, if we didn't learn from big tobacco lying about the addictive nature of cigarettes, I mean, what are we thinking going down this road of, of adding a new addictive substance to what we push out commercially? The public will never be able to keep track with the you know, for-profit spend uh, by uh, uh, companies that have a profit motive embedded in, in getting more people to use their product. And of course, more people using means more people who are going to become uh, at risk for both addiction and mental illness. Do, do we need national, do you feel like we have a national health care policy? That's where it really starts. Um, well, you know, the HHS just last week announced a new um, proposal for a pandemic office, kind of like a CDC, FDA level office within HHS. What I hope it includes is mental health. Like, let's not yeah. take for granted. We should have had not just Tony Fauci on the news. We should have had Tony Fauci and either, you know, Nora Volkow or Josh Gordon, like the mental health counterpoints to to because COVID was not a virus. It was a mental health illness because of the impact. Plus, it's physically with the uh, cytokines because of the inflammatory response. If you've had COVID, it's a legitimate psychiatric impact, especially on the long COVID leading to higher suicide rates. Why we have not integrated the screening for COVID, the vaccinations with COVID with similar inter early interventions for anxiety, depression, addiction in both of those cases is a real um, challenge we need to overcome. Well, not to mention, Patrick, the isolation. Remember that the, the the mental health impact of all of us being, you know, in our in our homes, you know, by ourselves, kids not having the opportunity to interact with other kids. That is another level just besides it is a is a is a repercussion of the of the virus. Well, on top of the fact that our kids are growing up on technology and are disconnected. Uh, when they're more connected, so to speak. So to, to great point that you just made. Tough. Thank you. Tough. Well, I'm going to get to some of the questions that are that are streaming and many, many good questions. And the first is, um, how, you know, what would collaboration with payers look like in application? And what would it take to make that collaboration with payers actually work? So I know we talked a lot about this in theory, but who would be the convener? Would this be, you know, uh, would this be, again, a statewide policy? Would this be from just one health uh, care organization uh, talking to a payer? How do we really get there, this collaboration? 
Well, you know, in, in Massachusetts, the governor, Republican governor, very proactive. He was in the insurance industry. He worked very closely with MassHealth to negotiate a whole new paradigm in reimbursement for care. And he holds the payers accountable where they're pitching in. So if they want market share, they have to collaborate. You know, that's what leadership really is. Um, as I said, CMS is beginning these value-based discussions. So getting the, the, the chief medical officer of uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid innovation to, to sit down and say, here are the new reimbursement codes. We're going to have value-based contracting bundled services reimbursed. We're going to have prospective payment models like these CCBHCs, these Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers, which now got doubled in size because of the recent appropriations for Congress. These are all new models. If you look at those CCBHCs, it's about getting the crisis management, prevention, housing, you know, support services all linked in one uh, place. Um, that's going to be what's necessary. And that's those are all payment models. Uh, so that's really where the answer is, Janet, is coming up with how do we experiment with these payment models where everybody gets their attribution for their piece in helping to reduce the total spent. Right. It really can be a win-win situation all across the board. Paul, do you have any thoughts on this? Absolutely. You know, it's it's very interesting because with payers, we we had a we had a work group that was a collaborative work group. It was it was facilitated by our Department of Managed Healthcare. It was a payer provider work group. And we had providers from uh, um, uh, it, and it was the way it was set up on one side of the table. We had representation from from uh, uh, consumers. We had representation from the psychological California Psychological Association, Psychiatric Association, hospitals, providers. I mean, it was a, a full gamut of, 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 of folks on that side. On the other side of the table, it was the payers. And what we were trying to get to was where could where do we have common ground? Where can we agree? And one of the things that that and and you know we this this went on for several years until there was some restructuring at the at the state level. But still, I'm still in touch with some of those folks that that uh, that were involved in that process. Um, interestingly, what we never solved for uh, was, you know, there are things like HEDIS measures that were that are, that are quality measures that the, that the plans use, okay? But they're created by the plans. They, they, don't, we don't, they don't have provider input. And I'll give you a perfect example is that years ago, the average length of stay in an inpatient psychiatric facility was 30 days. And this was 30 years ago, 35, 40 years ago. Today, the average length of stay that they want to see us uh, uh, produce is four, four days, four or five days. Okay, and and how did that come to pass? Is because those quality measures incrementally over time got to the point where okay, you uh, you've met you've met our, our requirements to get it down to ten days, and and now we're going to shoot for eight, and now we're going to shoot for six, and now we're going to shoot for four, and and the providers are just tearing their hair out saying, when's this going to stop? Yeah, it has to be. It has to be a collaborative. I understand cost containment. I I absolutely understand that. But we get to a point where the the uh, the best laid plans are are just are, are creating a, a a system that is that is dysfunctional. It's not helping, and it's it's created a system that is ending up costing us more in the long run. We need to have more of that collaboration like that payer provider work group where we're sitting down with the payers across the table and we're coming up with solutions. You know, the last thing in the world anybody wanted in that room was for it to have to go to, uh, uh, you know, somebody to find somebody to write a, write a piece of legislation to mandate that this happened. The providers don't want it. The payers don't want it. But I, unfortunately, in many cases, we haven't gotten, we just haven't gotten uh, traction or, or, or gained any ground without it. The federal mental health parity is, like, is, to me, is the equivalent of, of the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> I mean, it, it's yeah. absolutely necessary. And we need a right. version of that. Well, and that's like why conversations like this are important, so people really understand this. Another question, what role can schools play, or is it just asking them to do one more thing? And I'm assuming that means maybe educating students about mental health issues, about identifying mental health issues. And, and Patrick, you touched on that a little bit, but, but, get, but can schools be doing more? Yes, so it's exciting. The National Governors Association, bipartisan, Republican, Democratic governors, Democrat Murphy, Republican Asa Hutchinson, so I served with great guy, you know, um, with leaders like Governor Newsom. And a lot of these innovations are going to happen at the state level. 
I would encourage those who are listening to try to get on the National Governors Association agenda and really use this as an opportunity to build a platform that all states can look at as potential kind of recommendations for them to emulate. Because if we've got some best practices in some parts of the country, why reinvent the wheel? Why not just to embed them in, in the schools, for example, in certain other parts of the country where they could benefit? There's no question in my mind this is really the, the holy grail is mm -hmm. early intervention. Mm -hmm. And it's kids, kids, kids. So learn how these kids learn how to self-modulate, how to understand. They ought to have neuroliteracy. I mean, if these children do not know how to manage their emotions, feelings, problem solve skills, we're going to send them out into the world with high stress, toxic environment. And, and employers, much like 30 years ago, they were insistent on, well, what do we need for our future workers? We need math, science, technology, STEM programs, science, technology, and math. Well, what we need today is not the engineering, math, science, and technology. We need those. But if they, people don't have the ability to self-modulate, to cope with stress, they're not going to be the kind of productive workers who are going to have stability in the workforce, who are not going to churn in and out of these big companies. So it seems to me the Benioffs, the Salesforce, Force, the Moynihan's, the Bank of America, for all of these companies, they really need to be as purchasers pushing the payers to come up with these new models. Um, so, and as you saw, you saw Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway try to do this because they weren't satisfied with the way the insurance were operating insurers. So I, I really think this is a moment we can't just wait as, as Paul was saying on government to, to write the solution. We need corporations who have an existential need in getting productive workers. Those workers can't be productive if their kids are struggling. I can't tell you the number of times you know, uh, and, and so this is a, a, a real bottom line issue, for example, with Salesforce or any other major company in your area. Um, and if kids aren't well, their parents aren't going to be focused on their work. So it's not just the real good, do good thing, feel good thing. Oh, yes, it's the right thing because it's prevention. This is a, 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 a challenge right now. Uh, for employers, I think employers are going to be pushing the payers to do a better job because, frankly, the payers are only doing the health care fiduciary costs. They're not really evaluating the total benefit of providing mental health uh, as part of medical care because the, the, the ROI is also felt, as I said, in reduction of disability and workers' comp and an increase in productivity by the way, the Uniteds don't capture that, right? The, the mm. Kaiser's don't, the Blue Cross's mm. don't. So payers are going to have to be the ones that drive a lot of this change. And by payers, I mean the corporations that hire the insurers to, to, to manage their networks. Yeah. Another question. It seems athletes and even some celebrities are increasingly playing a role in this conversation, which is absolutely true. Do you believe that this will help normalize the need for treatment and Paul, you want to speak to that? Well, I uh, this this is this gets to be a sensitive uh, uh, subject. There there is a there is a principle in in a twelve step recovery program uh, called the twelve tradition that 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 requests anonymity on the at the level of press, radio, and films from folks. And the reason for that is that if someone comes out and 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 becomes a a, a very outspoken advocate for that and, and then and then falls down. Uh, you know, the, the fear is that it sends a message that the that, that recovery does not work. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's it's one of those things that uh, trying to uh, maintain a, a balance and a boundary between professional and personal. Um, I, I clearly understand why, you know, why, why folks want to get out there and be in the public uh, eye uh, for that. I, I honestly, I think that, that when we're talking about stigma and, you know, when I hear Patrick speak about his experience, that that is an uplifting message, you know, yeah. and 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 borne out by years of of, of commitment to you know to this work, um, and, and, my, and myself included. I just I just I take it with a grain of salt when I see something like that. Hmm. Patrick, what do you think? So I think we'd be a lot further in this country if the 28 million Americans like Paul and myself. We're not hiding in church basements. Now, I know I'm being provocative when I say that, 
But the fact is, Bill W., our founder of 12-Step Recovery, testified in front of Congress. And a lot of my fellows in recovery don't know that history. And I see it as part of the 12-step tradition of helping one another that we need to vote for candidates who do the right thing. We need to have the kind of sophistication in our advocacy that the environment has in holding uh, members of Congress and other elected officials accountable to their top 10 list of most important issues. We don't do that in mental health. We need to start doing that. I'd also uh, say that, you know, a lot of people say that they, they've got lived experience, but they don't really expound on it. And I don't necessarily think that's helpful. Um, I think it would be more helpful. People talked about their real life struggles, which means not all the stories end in good, happy endings, but they're real, which means people can identify with them. Sometimes you only get someone's story when they have the happy ending. They can say, oh, well, listen, I got 11 years of sobriety. This thing's worked out. And people say, well, that's not me. So I, I'm actually going to do a new book um, following up on my original uh, Common Struggle book featuring about uh, two dozen um, profiles, both well-known and not well-known, across all the kind of diagnoses and, and socioeconomic and ethnic backgrounds so that we can understand the real deep dive. Because what we get from Bradley Cooper and Simone Biles it's tangential. It's just, yeah. hey, I've been there too, but there's no more. Well, tell us how did it work for you? Like, yeah. what was your care pathway? Because if they're like me, I was struggling in and out for years. Yeah. I did not have cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the evidence form of treatment that I'm a Kennedy and I'm not getting evidence-based treatment is a story. And, yeah. and so what I'm saying is like, we need people to know um, that the system has failed them a lot of the time. They shouldn't take it personally, but there are th things that they can do personally to, to stay on their journey um, and try to get the help that they need. So um, I hope that's not too much of an experience. No, message. it's good. And I so appreciate both of you sharing your own personal stories because it's not easy to do. It certainly isn't easy to do, as, as, as you know best. I, one final question and just a short answer. What are the two or even one or two top action items that our viewers can take today to help move this conversation forward? And Paul, I'll start with you. I would just say educate yourself on, on, on what's going on in our in our healthcare system. Yeah. Thank you. Patrick? Well, um, at uh, parityregistry.org, uh, people have a chance to file a complaint where they feel that their insurer has wrongfully denied their care because of onerous medical management practices, pre-authorization, retroactive review, concurrent review, much to Paul's point about the squeezing down of coverage. And mm -hmm. if we can get more people to have specific complaints, then we can match those complaints with people all across the country. And then we can show patterns and practices of discrimination by certain payers which means that we can hold those payers more accountable because we can go to Marty Walsh, who oversees all ERISA plans at Department of Labor, who, by the way, is another person who's publicly in long-term recovery, and he can call up those payers and say, you still want to get CMS reimbursement under your Medicare Advantage program? Well, you better shape up here because we have this pattern in practice, and we've married this data and these people with the Millman study, and it's beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're not following federal law. So, so what I'm saying, Janet, is we need people to sign up so they can get this information at parityregistry.org or paritytrack.org, where we have every one of the 50 states scorecard as to where they are and where they need to go. So if they need to advise their state reps, senators or candidates where they need to be, they have more knowledge to, to Paul's point on what to do. Well, that's great. So educate ourselves and action. I want to thank you so much. Our, our time together is coming to an end. First of all, I want to say thank you so much to the Commonwealth Club for being our host and our partner today for this really important topic. I know that we all learned a lot. And Patrick and Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this morning and sharing your insight and your expertise. We thank you for not only what you've done today here, but all the work you, you do every day around mental health, awareness, access, and advocacy. It really is.
Thank you, Janet. And Janet, thank you for the work that you do at the Clinic by the Bay. 